Now, we don't know if, if stars have an inner sensation or not, but I certainly don't feel like I'm being wacky and charitable when I grant some sort of innerness to other beings, including non-animal beings on the planet. Cannabis truly is a pharmacy and a flower. Survival comes with cooperation. Pleasure is healing. You're being a warrior of the weird. I'm Lex Pelger, Director of Education at CV Sciences, and this is The Lex Files. This week, I'm speaking with Dorian Sagan. He's a science writer, philosopher, and magician, as well as the son of two famous personalities in the world of science, the astrophysicist Carl Sagan and the biologist Lynn Margulis. Our conversation is as wide-ranging as his books. We explore the meaning of biological life, the evolution of sexuality, the genetic basis for aging, the secrets of sleight of hand magic tricks, and what it was like to collaborate with his world famous scientist mother. Dorian is not just knowledgeable about scientific facts, but he brings a fresh perspective and challenging ideas to his understanding of life. So if you've got any curiosity about our place in the cosmos, you're sure to learn something new from this conversation with Dorian Sagan. Hello, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here today with Dorian Sagan. Thanks for joining us. Hey, how are you? I'm happy to be here with you, Lex. Yeah, it's good to see you again. It's been a while. The inimitable Lex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dorian, someone else with an excellent name. Lex is writing, right? Isn't that the... Or law, isn't that, actually. Yeah, law and Latin. Let, when we say lexical, has to do with reading, though. It's true. Yeah, and a lexicographer is a dictionary person. Caveat lector, right? Is um, yeah. a beware reader. Of course you know that. It's been like three people in my life who have known that. <laughs> That's good. All the other ones have dyslexia. <laughs> <laughs> or uh or analexia which i met her yeah <laughs> <I'm>... <laughs> <laughs> all right so for you mr dorian sagan your linkedin profile says that you're into writing philosophy and magic and so i kind of wanted to take things in that order because you've written or co-written over 25 books which is pretty amazing and your book what is life is often called a masterpiece and it's included on a great list called mind altering masterpieces which i think is a great description of it and for the encyclopedia britannica you along with your parents uh, lynn margulis and carl sagan wrote the entries for both life and extraterrestrial life which is fascinating so my first question was did you always want to be a writer I don't know if I always, that's like, a, you're making me, you're asking me to do a retro, <laughs> a retro objection yeah. into what I always wanted to be. I think everything in a way is writing. We all leave our mark. There's a, you know, what the postmodern philosopher that a lot of people hate without knowing or giving him a chance, including me when I first came up to him, um, Jerry, that calls general writing. So, you know, as a material, writing as uh, Maurice Blanchot, a Frenchman in the same country from which you're conducting this interview said life writing is a physical thing it's a it's a scrap of bark you know it's a piece of coal it's it's and and those material interactions are the basis of even the questions that you ask people cerebrally with relation to psychopharmacological drugs so there's a sense in which everything is writing you know you could argue that and that's one thing that Derrida has argued um when you think about it more specifically as to the art of writing yeah i think i always was a, a intrigued by the idea that I used to um, fall asleep to my mother typing her thesis and her books after my parents split up. And so that was actually a kind of a lullaby. It was kind of a, it was almost a doo-doo, you know, the, uh, <laughs> the um, security blanket of sound, which was something that, you know, I might, I, I was too early to aspire to that at the time, but I had a good feeling about it. It was kind of a comforting milieu of the world. And also when my parents were, uh, very young. I mean, my, they met when my mom was uh, 16 and my father was 19. And when I was born, they had, I'm sure, um, graduate students and they were talking to each other. So I was exposed to these kinds of con intellectual conversations at a, at a safe remove from, uh, from the time I was in utero. It makes me, the question makes me think of something that a Brazilian um, writer, Clarice Lispector, said about her own writing. And I would agree with the uh, emotional thing, or at least the tenor of what she said about writing, which is that she's only happy when she's writing. 
but now that we've made writing a general thing, you know, you're allowed to be <laughs> happy even if you don't have a cudgel in your hand to slap away at some manuscript. But um, she also said, and I thought I find this fascinating and beautiful, and and um, and I'd like to steal it, but I always give her credit so far that when she was young, she thought that books were like babies or flowers that they just grew, they just came into the world. And I think actually, if you take a step back, you know, through all the layers of anthropocentrism and cultural acculturation, <laughs> and just you know being in general, I mean. You could, as an alien coming to Earth, say, well, this is a thing that it's a very interesting object that you see one, you see more, maybe it's reproducing, and then it, it joins up with people's heads and then has subtle effects. So it would probably, you'd have to be a real good alien biologist looking at terrestrials to figure out exactly what it was that those little objects were doing. And my father said, uh, a book is a magical object, you know, it's something that you can not to be too anti-positivistic about it, but speak with the dead. And the dead can speak with you more easily than you can speak with them. And their ontological status is in doubt. But at the same time, it's a kind of a, it's kind of a time machine. And then you could go on and say it is um, thaumatogenic in the sense that you can look at black and white letters on a page and see colors. It's synesthetic. It's more worthy of some of Terence McKenna's... Um, epistemological pronouncements on the evolution of uh, consciousness than some of the drugs he was taking, probably. <laughs> Absolutely. And what you're saying reminds me of something I heard Dr. Jeffrey Kripal say about how the magic of books and how often books that were written manifest something within a couple months after it in, in world history, especially science fiction, it often goes that way. And it, it also reminded me of what you said earlier about Books almost growing. I remember hearing Fran Leibovitz say that almost none of the writers she knows enjoy writing. And I feel lucky that I do. Um, and mm -hmm. part of the reason is it feels like the books are just revealed. You know, these Moby Dick mm. pot books, they're just there. I don't really, I did all the study and now they're just mm -hmm. like the little boy asks about the, the marble. How did you know there's a horse inside that marble? Well, it was just mm -hmm. there. And it feels mm -hmm. that way with mm -hmm. with books and you hear that often the muse is just there revealing it and i was wondering if your books come to you like that how much is hard work and how much is just oh this is obviously what it should be oh uh, i i don't know that's um i think um you know sometimes like poems can come because you let them come too i mean but if you let a if you let a, a longest prose manuscript come you might get in a lot of trouble i mean i find that there's a lot of I'm not often dissatisfied with something and change it. And then I'm dissatisfied with that and change that. And, and then, you know, there's a saying that artworks, they're never finished. They're just abandoned, which I don't think is completely true, but both the romantic um, model of inspiration and uh, the idea that um, you have to revise, 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 and then you're finished at some semi-arbitrary point. I think they both, they both hold true. I did write a poem about um, a book as being a baby. And one of the lines in it is, um, remember, you're its parent, not its friend. <laughs> you know, So like establishing a distance, because that is like, you know, there's a separation involved too. Especially, I think, if it is going to go walk on its own in the world. And also, I think most importantly, I think this is very important for a work for probably for anybody ultimately, but at least for me, to be satisfied with it when I pick it up, I want it to be. It's in a. It's in a, a relationship with me. I don't want to just be the craftsman who's like looking at it and saying, "Is this good?" I want to be sucked in to this entity, and that's a sign that it is at that point a kind of other entity, and it has a certain self sufficiency. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Joseph Campbell said that you have to be ready to drown your children when it comes to this stuff. If the book isn't there, it's not there, and you have to be ready to abandon it. And how many kids did he have? I. It's a good question. <laughs> any uh, any remaining ones? <laughs> yeah, that's kind of a that's kind of a, um, a violent writing metaphor, which is um, most famous to me in um, um, that little book that uh, Stephen King wrote called On Writing. Which I think it's the only book of his that I've read all the way through, but. Uh, 
you know, you have to kill your darlings, which I found out was actually, that's, that, that wasn't actually him. It was in some of the, um, you know, writers magazines before that. So I think he, he might've discovered it and appropriated it or just decided not to, that it, it could be his at that point, but to kill your darlings is also kind of a violent, <laughs> it's a kind of violent metaphor, but I like the one that's more, a little bit more quantitative is, um, go through your manuscript and be ready to uh, remove 40% of it. Or um, what I just read about this new book by sort of, it's not really by him, but it looks like it is because of the way his name is in the, the Vonnegut letters um, on uh, a book on writing where he says have, and, and where his interlocutrix uh, says have the guts to cut. They're all saying the same thing. Again, to talk about as an organism, if you look at the supposed growth ratios of organisms in Fibonacci, at Fibonacci proportion numbers, like, you know, Da Vinci's um, naked man, I forget what his name is right now, but he's supposed to have those kinds of uh, Fibonacci proportions. So 40 is very close to 38.2%. It's a Fibonacci number. So if you had something that was completely self-similar and you cut it off, maybe more, maybe more easily at a Fibonacci number, and it was in essence the same, although stuff got removed from it, it would seem to be a more robust living art form. And the purpose of these art forms is to go out there and change the world. And your books are about science, often really the nitty gritty, such as Into the Cool, Energy Flow, Thermodynamics, and Life. And it's really deep science books. And how do you hope that these are going to impact people as they read them and change the way they live. Well, first of all, that book is not, that's not, I wouldn't call that my book. I'm second author on a book um, with um, Eric D. Schneider, who's now retired. He actually is in Arizona right now. He doesn't even do email. I can talk about him, but I just want to point out that some of the stuff you're saying, mine is really co-authored stuff. And that's really because I was taken under the wing by my mother. You know, I went into school and I wanted to do something more literary, you know, and I was a comparative literature major, but my second language wasn't really strong enough at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. So I switched to history. I got, I lucked into some nice philosophy as courses like intellectual history of the 20th century and existentialism. But um, that desire and my parents, you know, my, my mother especially was worried about me. I know from letters <laughs> that I read after she died that I was uh, to my ex girl, to my girlfriend at the time. So they were talking behind my back epistolarily, but they're worried that I didn't take things seriously enough. You know, I liked, I liked Oscar Wilde and punk rock and I wanted to have fun and I kind of like witticize everything. And that, that was kind of my mode was, you know, what was I going to do for a living? <laughs> you know, and she made available certain opportunities that eventually became foundational in my quote unquote career. And after we worked together on several projects, and we continued to work for decades, and um, at a certain point, you know, she would get people, as my father sometimes got, but a little bit more exciting, because he would get like crank letters from people, you know, saying crazy things. And actually, his secretary says that they called it the Fissured Ceramic File, which was a fancy way of saying crackpot, <laughs> Fissured Ceramic File. But with her, she would get some very interesting people who... Um, first of all, respected, you know, her, her intellect and also, you know, later on her reputation to champion secondary or unknown scientific ideas that weren't part of a consensus because she had advantage against all odds and hard work to do that. And so I'm certainly not saying that Eric D. Schneider was a crackpot or is a crackpot, but, um, He's one who, like, she didn't have time for and ended up on my lap. And I've had many opportunities to do that. And, and what's happened over the course of my science writing career is that I've been able to connect each person who I basically apprenticed myself to as a non-scientist, but scientifically inclined and open to it and integrating it and a philosophically minded scientific popularizer. I've been able to integrate them. So they kind of weave together. So the thing with, um, and so that, I just wanted to make that clear because it's not, I wouldn't, I'm not comfortable saying those are my books, but at the same time, they are my books, but I just wanted to give a fuller picture of their origin, uh, that one specifically. 
He is a um, PhD with geology, working on plate tectonics at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, and then he worked for NOAA. In any case, he became fascinated by the question of the relationship between thermodynamics and life. And that has turned out to be absolutely fascinating for me and completely dovetailing into a lot of my mother's stuff, including the way you know bacteria and other microorganisms can get together, come inside each other, either by infection or by... Um, eating and lack of digestion on the one hand or overcoming the infection on the other and that those sorts of organisms are foundational literally to our the cells in our body and that's a whole big subject but the basic process which was a term um, invented by a Russian guy named Marashovsky is symbiogenesis the coming together not just into symbiotic alliance not just sharing the same room from a member of, a, of the same species or a different species but one organism going into another, not even necessarily species, and coming together, that has a thermodynamic dimension too. So does the Gaia hypothesis, because that has explicitly was discovered on the basis of looking for um, a thermodynamic marker in the atmosphere on the, during the search to Mars. There's much, much more that could be said about this, but the basic idea, I would say, is that that book talks about a fourth Copernican deconstruction. And the first one we could say is that... Um, Earth is at the center of the universe? No. The second one is that um, life is made out of some special stuff, vitalistic stuff, different from everything else? No. You know, uric acid can be made from inorganic things. Our body come from uh, atoms come or from space, from the Earth, where where DNA is a is a physiochemical process involved with metabolism and other things that humans are the most evolved species, or, or rather that humans are, uh, that's actually a caricature of the religious thing that it was a deconstruction of it, the idea that people are above living beings, that there is something special and created about people versus the rest of life. No, because Darwin showed that we have a primate ancestry and it goes further back in primates it goes further back in animals so that is another major scientific deconstruction of previous ways in the western world of thinking of things and i would argue that this one is at that level of excitement and changing of what who you uh what you think about where you are and who you are and it is uh, it can be described as the um realization that the activity of non-living energetic systems that are technically a, a, away from thermodynamic equilibrium, meaning they're doing something, they're swirling, they can be storm systems, they can be autocatalytic chemical reactions like bellosov sabotinsky reactions, they can be um, convection cells in the atmosphere or on photographic plates that assume a hexagonal shape as they transfer energy and allow it to spread from a concentrated source into the surrounding, which is a description also of what life is doing. So life is not, life. you're not alive if you're not doing anything. A bull, after it gets killed in the bull ring, is lying there. It's very similar chemically to what it was a couple of minutes ago, but it's no longer um, a cycling a chemical system that's maintaining itself autopoetically through metabolism. That's gone. And that process is an example of a thermodynamic disequilibrium. That, that process can be seen in the atmosphere, theoretically alerting aliens with our level of technology, without looking at lights on cities or seeing any organisms at all, that there's something very different about Earth as a whole. In the biosphere, it's out of thermodynamic equilibrium. It's like um, coming onto a beach and seeing... Uh, a sand castle, you know something's going on there. And what's going on, basically, is the use of solar energy to produce these structures on Earth that are interconnected, that are excellent at dissipating energy. So not only does life not violate the famous second law of thermodynamics that um, suggests entropy or quote-unquote disorder, though that's not the best way to describe it, is increasing but it actively increases this production of waste entropy, mostly as heat. And, and, and that, I think, is fascinating when you look at it in broad philosophical 
context because it actually gives a material answer to why we exist. It's actually a, it's actually a version of the, of the answer to what is the purpose of life. And the purpose of life, as with these cycling systems, maybe even the red spot of Jupiter for such a hydrodynamic system, certainly the hurricanes that reduce pressure gradients in the atmosphere and these autocatalytic chemical systems, is to use up available energy. Now, the thing with life is it can replicate itself. So the storm, the like the slow motion storm or the cold fire, because we're basically burning metabolically at room temperature on Earth, has found ways to keep on going and renewing itself. And those ways are connected to our sensations. We feel pleasure when we eat, when we're finding, tap into that gradient. You know, we feel pleasure in other things too, like insects, which is connected with the replication of the system that's doing that. So I, you don't want to be, I mean, it's very easy at this point for, for um, the literary minded, let's say, or the religiously inclined to say that's so reductionist. But I actually think it's the opposite. I think it's a, it's a fount of beautiful future perspectives and poems and stuff. And, and, and to me, it, it, it takes the whole materialistic uh, perspective a step further, and it actually shows a really deep connection between minds and bodies, because the mind is also involved in this, and the mind is also using, the brains are using, I think it's 40% of the oxygen from the hemoglobin in your body, for example. So these actively processing systems, now we don't know if, a, if stars have an inner sensation or not, but I certainly don't feel like I'm being wacky and charitable when I grant some sort of innerness to other beings, including non-animal beings on the planet. I think that's, that's actually more likely than the, um, the opposite, which is sort of a prejudice of post-Cartesian European culture. Yes. And it's exactly that which I always find so inspiring in your writings is that, yes, it could at one level could be viewed as reductionist, but it talks so much about the interdependency of everything that, you know, with your mother's theory of the Gaia hypothesis, it takes it all the way up to the entire earth being a living organism. And it's it's like your science is taking us to where psychedelic drugs uh, or near death experiences often take us that this oneness of all of it being interconnected and you're doing it through science. I would temper that um, with at least one qualification, which is that it's precisely not an organism of which my mother's contribution to the Gaia hypothesis that originated in the search for life on Mars in an office that um, her ex-husband, my father, Carl Sagan, shared at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena with um, James Lovelock. He's the one who came up with it because they were trying to find ways to find life on Mars. And it, it, he had a kind of an epiphany after, partially because he read Erwin Schrodinger's uh, book, What is Life? Before the discovery of the molecular biology of you know, cells and DNA and all that. But um, he talked about, uh, Schrodinger did about, you know, um, it, having a thermodynamic component. And um, Lovelock saw, well, if I saw that the atmosphere had gases, which should be were thermodynamically not stable, that would suggest that you have a life. And then they, the, the results came back and they saw carbon dioxide is over 95% on Mars and Venus. And he saw it on Mars and he said, There's, you don't have to go. There's no life there. Hmm. Now, um, however, I would say that his idea that there was the Earth was being regulated um, by organisms for the sake of life as a whole um, was a, was a, a hypothesis and and was not conclusive until my mother provided in detail many of the microbes that were continuously exchanging gases and making that would be unstable atmosphere stable by continuously modifying and showing that at the systemic level of the entire planetary surface, the biosphere, there was a, a, a process that was keeping it as a body. However, one of the big differences between Lovelock, who is very quick to talk about Earth as an organism, leave alone the teleology of saying for the good, whatever that would be on the whole, 
she points out not only the specific source of contributions from the microbes and their gases that made it visible as a, a, a non-equilibrium thermodynamic system be, uh, through spectroscopy, but also that it's not an organism in a way because it's more than an organism, although you could also argue it's less than an organism. It's more than an organism in the sense that these wastes that are inevitably being produced by organisms that I mentioned earlier in the context of thermodynamics that ultimately wind up as entropy, which is heat. But for real um, organisms that you know, they have often gaseous, liquid, and solid wastes, okay? The Earth as a biosphere doesn't do that. It's there, There's some space junk going out that's not it's not like connected to its metabolism that's humans and then there's some you know meteoroids coming in that's basically all that's being transferred across those boundaries this is a much sleeker being this is like a huri in uh islam islam that has doesn't defecate menstruate or urinate you know this is a really sleek being and for us to think that we're granting it some big favor by saying it's an organism. We need to take a reality check and say, no, we're not at that level yet. Wow. That's a great way of thinking about it. Yeah, it's more more along the lines of angels and gods. Exactly. It's an angel. Like, what could be more? Okay, this guy who I actually talked to, um, he's the most cited neuro, uh, uh, neuroscientist, Carl Friston. He, um, he also is in the, in the papers in, in Great Britain where he, he lives a lot about, um, because he's an expert on modeling in general, so they, they ask him questions about the virus. But this guy, if you read up on, on him, there's a good article in Wired about him that I think is open access. He started off um, working in a mental hospital, and that was one of the reasons that got him really curious about <laughs> mental processes. And he said, and one, there's plenty, there's other more colorful examples, but one of um, the things that intrigued him was one of the patients who was fixated on the question of angel shit, angel shit. Now this, I think, from the, if, if we can imagine the biosphere as an angel, that seems to be a pretty credible form of waste production for such a celestial being. At CV Sciences, we love our full-spectrum hemp products. But for some people with sensitive jobs or sensitive systems, they want something with 0% THC. So we create a line of products called Happy Lane. Made with CBD from hemp grown in Kentucky, we have gummies, we have chews, we have liquids, we have soft gels, and we have the always beloved CBD roll-ons for applying to your skin. Everything is non-GMO, vegan, purity tested, and manufactured in the United States. So when life has you wound up, tense, agitated, antsy, uptight, jittery, or jumpy, try our Happy Lane line of CBD products. For 25% off, use the coupon code LEXFILES at pluscbd.com. It's funny because that actually relates to the next question, which is sex and angels. That's a big thing in angelology. And you've written many, many books about sex uh, and the evolution of sexuality, one of which has been on my science bookshelf for 20 years now. I've been admiring that book. It's a great, great piece of work. Which one was that? The, the hardbound, uh, What is Sex? Okay, uh, yeah, that's a, that's yeah. the most, I think that's the rarest, but I agree that's probably the best in a way. Yeah, it's uh, it's a beautiful it's a beautiful edition, and I was curious, you know, for all the different areas of science you can write about, what keeps drawing you back to the mysteries of sex? Well, I mean, sex sells. What more do you need? <laughs> How stupid do you think I am? No, just kidding. <laughs> but, First of all, let me preface by saying if you if you really are interested in the nitty gritty of that question, the evolution of sex. I did do a video with the Apple Lab, the Apple Mixes Lab that's on YouTube um, last the end of last year. It was kind of fun. I you know I wrote it out, so it's a prepared presentation, um, and it's called "The Tiger, the Sex Act, and Promiscuous Bacteria Toward a General Theory of Sex." And it's actually like a over like an hour and a half. It's two parts, and it's a little bit technical. But these are people in Mexico who are in a laboratory 
who are trying to um, examine so-called apomictic plants that have given up their sexuality, which also means they they can be easier to grow. But it's a philosophical. It's not it's not about plants per se. It's about the whole history of it. And it was for like um, kind of a um, a celebration of the anniversary of the lab. But it's all in English. I think if you want, to, you can probably watch it in Spanish too if you want, if you have that proclivity. And there are subtitles. So that's my that's my um, what do you call it uh, when you advertise something? <laughs> Your um, pitch. Pitch. Thank you. That's my pitch. But to answer the question, um, I wrote again with my mom on this. Um, first, it was a, not really a, um, a popular book at all, but it's Yale University Press. But it is a description of the possible origins of our kind of sex. Lots to be said, but um, you know, our kind of sex is reproductive sex, which is actually a minority within the case of all beings on the planet. Most of them do not use sex to reproduce. On the other hand, most of them do have sex. Actually, when a virus infects you, that is, by a biological definition, genetically sex. Bacteria can trade from a few to almost all of their genes. And they do that, and they can not only enjoy it if that's what they're doing, but they can also get new genes which keep on working in them. They don't have to produce a new being. Like I could go, if I had bacterial sex with you, I could come up with different color hair or something, you know? I'm not saying I'm going to do it that, don't worry. <laughs> yeah, but it's so amazing. They, in that way, they have like evolution. a global adaptive system. And the bacteriologists, uh, Soren Sané and Maurice Panacet, said that they were equivalent, and this was all, uh, in the 80s, they said they were equivalent to like a, a global internet or a super organism in a sense. And the idea of um, species is also put into question by the, the, the rampant sex among bacteria because the most common definition of species has to do with a population whose members can fertilely interbreed. And bacteria don't do that. So they don't fit the species definition. So when people, and you know, they're very Linnaean in their, in their um, scientific categorizing taxonomic mentalities and everybody gets a little attention by naming the species or supposed, supposedly contributing something, but a lot of it is just taxonomic bullshit. But when bacteria, they, they, they are not a species per se. And my mother argued that they weren't species later in her career. And so if they're not species, then they don't necessarily go extinct either. So these are, although we are phylogenetically and evolutionarily and symbiogenetically composed of prokaryotes, archaea and bacteria, if you like. In multiple episodes, at least um, two major symbiogeneses for all animals and then three for all plants and maybe more. Some even say there may have been viruses at the origin. They uh, are single genomic beings that are um, still trading genes in an ancestral mode. Now, that ancestral mode of bacterial sex may have been very prevalent early on in Earth's development because um, four or so billion years ago, between like four and three, when you might imagine that life had evolved on the surface, there was no ozone layer because ozone is composed of O3 molecules, three oxygen atoms per molecule, whereas oxygen is O2. And it was the cyanobacteria tapping into water as a source of hydrogen for electrons on the early earth that began the incidence of oxygen entering the atmosphere until it reached more or less its uh, current state of 20%. So not until oxygen and, and, and such quantities as to make an ozone layer had a, had developed would there have been protection from ultraviolet radiation ultraviolet radiation is known to produce viral outbreaks in bacteria so called bacteriophages bacteriophages are the most common form i won't say of life because i don't think viruses are alive but the most common organic form on earth's surface there's there's like more of them than there are stars in the universe and um, they, um, and they, and they, that's just one example. But in general, the ultraviolet radiation, and it seems, I mean, I may have a simplistic view of it, of it but it makes sense to me, sensible that they, that the, the molecules um, in an RNA world or the nucleotides that are um, vulnerable to radiation would break apart. And breaking apart and then coming back together is essentially what we mean 
when we talk about sex. From this point of view, if you had um, DNA and RNA or just RNA before there was metabolizing cells, you could argue that sex came before the origin of life. As in that, that blurb I gave that my pitch, um, that's more about the kind of sex that we involve in, which is reproductive sex. And that is interesting, too, because it, it relates to symbiogenesis in that the postulated early processes that were first sort of suggested by this Harvard um, biologist of um, organisms fertilizing, kind of proto-fertilizing each other, would have been a symbi symbiosis-like or, or in a manner that is similar to the sorts of things that happen between bacteria before they merge to become symbiogenetic. They be, in other words, the specific idea of the origins of sex that's in all these books that uh, you alluded to, including what is sex, is that during times of uh, extreme desiccation, starvation, Cells will tell to um, phagocytose each other, they tend to cannibalize each other and to eat each other. And a fraction of the time, what is swallowed, especially in organisms that don't have immune systems, is not completely digested. So Cleveland Chronicle, looking at these things under the microscope and seeing um, in some cases that uh, one organism of the same species, of the same kind, amoeba-like things, mastigotes, would sometimes swallow uh, each other, and then they would could even merge nuclear membranes and cell membranes, and then you would have twice the number of, of um, chromosomes. Well, in every one of our cells, except basically for our sperm and egg cells, there's two sets of chromosomes. So we're diploid organisms. Some plants grow in a haploid phase. It would be like a sperm or an egg cell growing as an independent organism. We don't do that. They also do polyploidy. But we have to go back to a sort of a single cell state. In fact, we don't identify with our diploid state. You know, from another perspective, we are not necessarily, um, you know, just the bodies. We're part of a process of which we are a fungible part. And so then that gets all connected to death and to aging which I read, wrote about with Josh Middledorf and uh, Cracking the Aging Code. It's a goofy, popular name, but it's still a decent book, especially the part that I, I wrote in the first person, the introduction. <laughs> <laughs> but the idea there is that it's another thing that's connected. So that, as I was saying earlier, I, it, this the symbio symbiogenetic stuff with my mom and the early earth and guy and stuff with my mom, the thermodynamic stuff, with um, Eric D. Schneider, and more recently, these ideas that um, are, are provocative um, reinterpretations and overcoming of the limitations of neo-Darwinism, although um, Mildorf would never call himself a neo-Darwinist, but he, but he knows the math and he shows that it can be applied to show a reason for why we age and that aging is not just, it's, it's not, for example, this is an example of the interdisciplinarity of, the, of my uh, lucky workload that I've been allowed to have, is that the common idea, and this is still the most common idea in science and in, in, in mainstream consensus, if you like, science, that we inevitably die because of an entropic process mediated by free radical damage can't be right. It, and even though there's neo-Darwinist models that show that, for example, William D. Hamilton showed that it's inevitable that organisms relate. Well, somebody else used similar math to show that it's in a, the opposite is inevitable, which tells you something about mathematical models. But, but more to the point, empirically, there's organisms that don't age in the sense of being more likely to die next year, this precise statistical sense of aging than this year. And so whales, for example, um, they live a very long time, but you know, this, to the best of my knowledge, there's no real knowledge of aging in some sharks and turtles. And those are our, those are core dates in our phylum, you know? And then there's, at, at the limit, there's, there's some beetles and there's some um, so-called, you know, immortal jellyfish, canadarians, I think that when they're stressed, they actually revert to an earlier stage in their life cycle. It would be like, it would be like, you know, you getting in an accident and then going 
through puberty in reverse. Now that's not aging. That's, that's, that's not even not aging. That's reverse aging. So the whole idea that we are, you know, th this oxygen rose in the atmosphere about um, starting about 1.8 billion years ago, based on oxidation of minerals in earth's crust. When that happened, and and when the mitochondria, the ancestors to the mitochondria, the proteobacteria, the ancestors to, to the organelles that are in in all of our respiring cells that are giving us the energy that we need as animals to exist on this oxygen rich planet, when those were evolving and becoming um, comfortable with the habitation of this oxygen is really reactive. It's a toxic to a lot of anaerobes to this day and will kill them. To these herb, this this new atmosphere that was rich in oxygen, life learned how to deal with so-called free radicals a long time ago. Is my point? You know, it's not like it was impossible to stop oxygen damage. We're using oxygen. We have free radical scavengers. So the mainstream. Um, what my, the point of that book, or I'm trying to summarize very briefly here, is that aging is genetically based, and the reason for that theoretically is that. In populations that tend to grow too fast, if they don't moderate their growth, and you don't have to be like Aesop to see this applies to humans now with all of our intelligence, which has short-circuited such a mechanism, they run the risk of death in mass by starvation, by predation, and by infection. And in organisms that have such tendencies, um, and this is anathema in uh, neo-Darwinism because it's considered impossible on mathematical grounds, basically it's group selection. But if you imagine for the moment that it's possible that po at the population level there can be ways of mediating this, and there is a lot of evidence for that, then it's a great advantage to save your potential population or clade by not endangering everyone by individuals just growing as fast as possible. You write a lot about deep time as well as books about the future. I was curious, what message do you most want to get out to people today about, about what they can do to improve the future? Well, Lex, I'm not a preacher yet, and I don't have any, and I'm not, you know, I'm not a true believer. I don't have any discrete message, and I would be leery of anybody who was too sure about their discrete messages. I mean, obviously, we have some big problems um, with our situation planetarily and with equality. And but I mean, I don't have any real answer with that. It would be nice to see to um, have what I I said in my interview with uh, Greg Ruggiero in the Los Angeles Review of Books: have sensuous anarchies to try to somehow incrementally like cultivate our relationships with each other and, and other organisms in sustainable ways to to not to, to to kind of like put to pasture this cookie cutter you know suburban reality have many different experiments in living that are consciously and and customarily and gendered and, and watered and, and so that we can maybe find ways to live in in um, sort of less with less of a feeling of being a speeding train <laughs> going you know linearly towards a wall when we're not on we're not going anywhere. We're we're does like Emerson said, there's no place to go. We're here. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a great message. A little bit more radical anarchy and acceptance. And you might not even want to broach the next question. I'm curious. Uh, and so on to the philosophy part uh, from what we talked about earlier. We've never talked about this before, you and I. Uh, so I'm curious, what are your spiritual beliefs, if any? And how do you think this world works at that kind of level? I'm like just a run, a run of the mill apophatic mystic, you know, I think. But maybe just a definition of uh, apophatic mystic. I, I, I do have a mystical streak, I'll be honest with you. Um, I, the word spiritual, that could be deconstructed. And I, I'd be, I would think it was almost more spiritual to talk about how non-living systems can, can without any um, human intervention, mirror things that we call spiritual. I mean, I, there's a guy who contacted me possibly to write a book together but it's not really in a shape where I can help him. I mean, it needs to go through right now. But the idea is, 
I find absolutely fascinating that um, what you see in um, the major monotheistic religions is the kind of forgotten algorithm to be careful about the environment that developed in like the great rift of Africa and similar places where there was lots of volcanism, lots of volcanoes, and that the idea of the war between heaven and earth, this was a major thing for early humans, and they also experienced like flying pieces of lava, volcanic lightning, and this resurg surging up of the earth in this really frightening manner that, off that periodically killed them, and that also recreated the earth like a sculpture, you know, as the lava tried, pouring into the oceans, just like crazy things that they um, were tempted um, because it seemed natural to, um, to anthropomorphize as entities, especially when the volcanoes, for example, are rumbling before they erupt. That seems to be a definite candidate for the kind of a tyrannical, angry nature of the monotheistic God in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. But that God somehow um, was offloaded into the goodness of the of the extraterrestrial space where we were left with the 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 subworld demonic version of of devil and hell. But these natural forces that have become all kind of mannerist in in the Bibles and stuff like that were at one time at, uh, um, uh, proto science and I think that spirit of recovering the spirituality if you like of the things themselves is more exciting than half remembering you know a discard a discardable anthropomorphism that was a place saver for future science Okay, cool. Uh, good. Thank you for sharing. I was I was quite curious. I didn't answer your question, though. Apophatic. Oh, yes, that's true. I'm curious. <laughs> it means characterized by negation. So in other words, you know, like in from the Bhagavad Gita, but I am the taste in the water. That's getting very close to nothing. <laughs> it's very good. It's getting very close to nothing, which is the kind of, you know, and I think that there is an issue. And that's, uh, and that I just want to go say one thing about that is, if you are dwelling spiritually on that, those sorts of negations, what is, I mean, practically speaking, what does that leave you with? It leaves you with what there is, which is exactly the object of study of science. So in a way, it's like becoming so mystic that you're, you know, you're, you're confronted again with the, the basic facts of, real, of, of what is real rather than searching for something beyond what is there. So I think maybe that's a, an answer for like the, why I'm attracted to the, those sorts of mystical tracks that are characterized more by negation and poetry than by, you know, obviously telling you what you should do or how things must always really be. And it's interesting. I just read something like that from uh, that guy, Stapp, who has theories about the quantum effects of uh, that might underlie consciousness. And he was saying how... So much of this, so much of mysticism would be negation, getting your ego out of the way and letting something higher flow through, which is what writers often talk about with mystical experiences or people talk about with trans possession experiences or near death experiences. Um, and that negation is often the way to access this stuff is getting rid of the little human part and letting something greater flowing through from what you might call the, the universal mind. And so that sounds like a bit of magic. And that was actually the last thing I wanted to talk about is you are a magician, a slate of hand magician. And he's doing tricks right now. And he is really good. It's fascinating to watch these cards just disappear, even though um, I see them right in front of this video screen. So I, it's too bad you can't see it, but you all can believe me. He's very good with his hands. And he, there's so much practice that goes into slate of hand magic. But I wanted to know, what did learning slate of hand magic teach you about life and how people work and think? I wouldn't like to write about magic. I've, I've met some really um, interesting magicians over my career. I mean, I knew uh, I had met Ricky Jay who died recently, James Randi. Ricky, Ricky Jay called me an odd duck when I was a teenager on Venice Beach. James Randi, I kind of had a following out with him 
over certain philosophical um, issues on the nature of reality. I think he was not very philosophical in the first place, but he was known for being a skeptic. I mean, I met at twice um, Di Vernon, who's the biggest uh, the biggest influence most people think on uh, close up or sleight of hand magic in the 20th century, and he went around gathering gambling moves and then very artfully uh, applying them. And to, and he taught a lot of other magicians. I didn't I didn't talk to him personally, but I did write him a letter one time. I took lessons from David Roth, who also died recently, uh, regarding his time as the best uh, coin magician. And um, you know, mag- magicians tend to have a lot of problems. They tend to be like, you know, locked in sort of an infantile adolescent macho phase, and they're all they're all you know at the ca- caricature level, they're all the best in the world, which is which is an epistemological problem <laughs> problem right there. And it's very much about knowing the secrets and being the tough guy. With I mean, we're familiar with this kind of from all sorts of fields of male human behavior, and magicians definitely didn't get short shrifted in that department positivism too i mean i think there's some unsophisticated philosophically unsophisticated magicians who think that because they can fool somebody they know they know the ins and outs of truth and non-truth or what poses as those so i have criticisms of uh, the magician's culture but at the same time you know i think like pure sleight of hand is could be very interesting and elegant to me it's most exciting for how do you apply the the sort of knowledge that's locked up in the art of fooling people in sleight of hand, how does that apply more broadly? How can you, for example, connect um, sleight of hand magic or what it, it it contains to the art of writing, for example? I think that's a fascinating question. And um, I, I think there are definitely a lot to be said about the connections between what magicians know and deception in general so i'm interested in sort of magic for its own sake but not only not only for its own sake i i mean i wouldn't want to do only (laughs) do only that and you know and it's kind of there is a kind of indulgence in the idea that you're better than somebody that you can fool them which is the reason why a lot of people don't like magic tricks i mean a large fraction of people don't like to be fooled and a lot of uh, there's you know other people are um and sometimes it could be the same person at different times. Actually, are I love love it because they take enjoyment in the um, experience of wonder that magic can sometimes provoke. And I I agree with Vladimir Nabokov, who said that everything enchanting in life and literature contains an element of deception. Well, as someone who loves Moby Dick, it has one of the most unreliable narrators in the world. You really can't uh-huh. quite trust what Ishmael's saying, and that adds a lot to the experience. Okay, yeah, I, I read that like on a porch in Toronto. I had like a, a used copy, and I and I felt like I was on a boat when I was reading it because it was in downtown Toronto, but it was like on the second floor over there. And um, but a lot, you know, I'm probably not the first one to not make it through the whale, right? Um, well, very everyone listen, I'd always recommend listening to it. There's an audiobook of it, okay. edition by Frank Miller that just rolls over. He was a Shakespearean actor. All right. I'm going to write that down. I can, I'll send you the Dropbox. In fact, if anyone is listening who wants that, just email me and I'll send you the Dropbox. It's amazing. Yeah, send it to me. I have a couple of free months coming up. <laughs> okay, good. How long is the whole thing? Uh, it's not that long. It's like 20 oh, okay. plus hours. So if you're commuting, oh, okay. I mean, it's like two weeks of commuting and you're done. And it's, you know, I think it's the best thing published on the American continent. That's um, cool. Send that to me. I would love to hear okay. it. That sounds good. Um, so, all right. Well, that was it. And thank you so much for, for sharing today about science and philosophy and, and your magic. It was great to hear. Thank you, Lex. You're a good interviewer. Thanks. Um, so I will have links to a bunch of your books in the episode notes. And I should say thanks again, Dorian, for taking the time to share. All right. Great. Have fun in France. You too. Okay. Okay. Bye. Thanks for tuning in. To listen to other episodes, check out pluscbdoil.com, listen on all the podcast platforms, or see us on YouTube. Subscribe to the CV Sciences YouTube channel to see each new episode. And if you'd like to buy any of our fine products, use the coupon code LEXFILES for 25% off. If you have any questions, compliments, or suggestions, feel free to write me at research at cvsciences.com. 
And please follow the podcast on Twitter, at The Lex Files Show, where I try to keep it fun. If you enjoyed this program, please give us a like on your favorite platform or share a link to your social media. It means a lot to us. The Lex Files is produced by Matt Payne. The YouTube videos are by Brendan Cleek. Thank you to Tina Molnar and Jasmine Morris for the visuals. And the music is by Jake Bradford Sharp. Our sponsor is CV Sciences, makers of America's favorite CBD oil. And I'm Lex Pelger, signing off.